Hi everyone and welcome back to the Power 365 show. Today's guest is primarily responsible for app experiences at Microsoft. App experience involves both model and canvas apps. Let's welcome Clay Wesner to the show, Principal Group Program Manager at Microsoft for Power Apps. As always, full show notes can be found at nz365guy.com forward slash 99. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, Clay, welcome to the Power 365 show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Clay, it's you've had a pretty interesting uh, accent there. I was at, recently at MVP Summit and heard you for the first time, and, and you're, you're, if you like, from my perspective, a newcomer to the team. Tell me, what's your background and how did you end up inside the Microsoft product team? Uh, I do have a little bit of an interesting accent. Uh, it seems to get more interesting as the the years go on. Uh, I, I'm Australian uh, by birth and for at least the first 20 something years of my life. Uh, I grew up in Brisbane, uh, then ended up spending a few years in Melbourne, actually, um, just before I left. And I thought Melbourne was going to be my home. Uh, you know, I bought a house there and and was about to settle down. Uh, and then I actually moved to Singapore for what was going to be a three-month uh, visit. It turned into three years. Um, and this was actually on a Dynamics 365 finance and operations project. Um, and then from then, I joined Microsoft and I actually moved to London for two years. And then after London, I moved to Seattle about three years ago. Um, so I haven't actually lived in Australia now for about, I can't do the math, but it's about eight years or, uh, coming up on 10 or something like that. Um, so my accent's gone a little bit global. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and that's sort of, um, you know what I mean? The talking about being relatively new to the scene. Uh, I've worked on uh, power apps for about the last year and a half now. Um, but before that was, I actually worked on the common data service, you know, unofficial version one. Um, so I worked on the team that launched that originally um, and supported it for the small amount of time uh, that it was around. Uh, and uh, before that, then I was working on finance and operations or AX for about 10 or 11 years or something like that. So wow. um, yeah, it's what I spent most of my time on in my career so far. So so you just mentioned CDS uh, 1.0. Is it all switched off now? I knew that you're heading for that, uh, you know, switch everything off. Is it done? Probably by the time this podcast airs, yeah. yes. Uh, it okay. is down to the absolute um, smallest, smallest percentage that are left. Uh, I think it's actually going to be the end of this month. They'll be all wrapped up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, you know, a bittersweet for me <laughs> as yeah, being yeah, on the yeah. team that, uh, that <laughs> built it. But um, a lot of it's front end stuff and a lot of it's UX and the concepts yeah. carried forward with CDS. Um, so yeah. it's definitely not that bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a stepping stone, a transition to what we have. And I tell you, what we have is pretty amazing now. So it's exciting times. I think so, too. So so the other thing there, you mentioned you're in London for two years. Do you miss London? I look, I miss parts of it. Uh, it is a beautiful city. Um, yeah. I, you know what I mean? I, I loved where I lived. Uh, I love the city. The, the two things I didn't really love about it was the traffic. Um, you know what I mean? The fact that you could be in your neighborhood, but still be in the car for another hour as you creeped down one way streets, um, to get home. Uh, and then the second one, I was doing so much work with the Redmond team, uh, at that point, I was on a plane every couple of weeks. Um, so I really wasn't spending that much time in, um, in Seattle. Um, I sorry, in London, I was spending most of my time in Seattle, uh, even to the point where back then I had a fairly big beard. Um, I was, I had a barber in Seattle and like, that's where I was getting my beard trimmed. I was spending so much time here. So I was a lot happier once I moved, everything was a lot more stable for me. So you've done that nine hour flight a few times in. Oh yes. I was an absolute pro of the, you know, the BA flight, uh, yeah. over here and back many, many times. Now I've done that a few times, even though I've only been in London 11 months. So uh, I, I'm, oh, wow. I'm starting to get to know it myself. Yeah, so yeah. interesting, interesting. So, okay, so you, you just to read between the lines there, because you came from an FNO background, I take it you were doing that, but was it partner side before you got into Microsoft? I was. Uh, so, okay. yeah, up in, before I moved to London, uh, I was with a partner for the whole time. Um, they're not, uh, they've, they've changed a lot since, uh, since I was with them, but um, it was what was Aston Business Solutions and then Tectura. 
um, for many, many years. They went through a few acquisitions over the time. Yeah. Okay. Incredible. So, so when you're not working, and we're going to jump into what you do and what you kind of own and the and the technology stack shortly, what do you get up to on the weekends? Uh, what are your hobbies? That type of thing. Uh, lots of sleep. <laughs> um, but the the main one for me is, I was about to say it's relatively new, but I suppose it's a couple of years now, is I have a uh-huh. two and a half year old French bulldog uh, nice. named Walter, uh, who is fairly demanding uh, of my time when I'm not at the office. Um, but it's good. He enjoys the Pacific Northwest. So, you know what I mean? Whether it's playing in snow or going for a hike or around the parks. Um, so it it tends to be during the week. You know what I mean? He's at home a lot. So weekends tend to be getting out and entertaining him a little bit around Seattle. Right. They're a fun dog. My uh, nephew has one um, in Sydney and he's actually just moving to Germany. Um, and they're and they're having the dog board up with them because it's, nice. it's a pure bread that they've got. And, mate, but it's a fun dog. They're a, they're a great breed. He's, a, yeah. he's an awesome little guy. I, for years, never had dogs mainly because I traveled so much. Um, it's only been in the last couple of years where I've sort of, now that I'm in Seattle, my travel's cut down a lot compared to what it was. It was the first time really in my professional or adult life where I could actually, you know, get and care for a dog. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So you're in the app experience team within, um, you know, the power platform, um, uh, broadly tell me about, um, what's the lie of the land? Who's, what are the kind of various uh, moving parts, if you like, of the power platform from the world you live in? If you like, what are the key pillars that you see in there? And I know uh, I'm asking this question just kind of more as an update of, you know, it's always <laughs> changing. There's always transitions happening. There's teams being realigned. And um, so where, where do they kind of sit from your perspective right now? Sure. So, I mean, power platform all up. Uh, we obviously have Power Apps, Flow, and Power BI. Mm-hmm. Uh, my focus is very, very well uh, landed inside Power Apps, um, and then within Power Apps, we focus on a. Few, we have teams focused on a few different things. Um, you know what I mean on our on our maker and ALM experiences, and sort of like the life cycle of an app. We have a team focused on uh, data experiences, so how you work with connectors, how you work with entities views, forms, all that cool, rich uh, data stuff. Um, We even have a team dedicated on uh, mobile experiences and how the players work and things like that. Um, Where my team focuses, uh, app experiences, is sort of then like the catch-all of a lot of other things uh, in really the wrapper around that in how you actually build an app. So the controls, the app model across both Canvas and... um, model, uh, the expression language, PCF, uh, our new component framework, um, basically all the tools that you have there uh, at your disposal to go and actually build a Power App. Um, And when I say Power App, I'm talking Canvas and model customizing dynamics, the broadest extent of the, the definition of Power Apps these days. So, so would you say you owned the UI? Would that be correct? Uh, within the designer studio, uh, yeah, a large portion of it. Um, and so for actually the app studio and the app designer, uh, as well as a lot of the actual controls that people bring to um, use their, the actual controls people use to build their apps. Um, ultimately, the, the sometimes the double-edged sort of power apps is that really it's our makers that own their UI. Um, we, but definitely, yes, we're giving them the tools and the controls to actually go build their apps. Yeah, but as in, in our current, you know, environment, and I mean, PCF is going to be a very interesting journey, and I think it's kind of the bit that's going to make the entire world of what's possible um, more infinite, if you like, than it ever has, um, with the, the various possibilities that PCF is going to allow. But really, you would hold the constraints of, if you like, the upper level nav of the system and the left hand nav as it is at the moment, right? You would... Yep. That would be under your control. And then really outside those boundaries are then what the maker really has control of moving forward, right? Correct. And and we're trying to open up a lot of that. Um, so, you know, I mean, right now, especially on Canvas uh, and even on model, you know, there are a limited set of controls. So, you know, a button looks the way we want it to look. 
um, you know, apart from themes and some properties, similar with navigation, similar with commanding. Uh, and that's actually why PCF is so cool, is that really it's the same framework that we internally use. Um, so then it really means that if you don't like the way that we do commanding or something along those lines, um, you're going to have the tools now to actually engage a pro developer um, you know what I mean? Or a more advanced developer and actually build a control to look at exactly the way that you want it to look. Yeah. So, so to, first of all, can you describe the app experience and what do you think about when designing the app experience for your makers? Ooh, that is a, um, that is an ever, ever going question, even for us. Um, so the, really we're out where we focus and how we focus is thinking about it end to end. Um, so, you know what I mean? You hear us use words like maker and user a lot um, for our sort of internal personas. Um, but when we're really designing a feature, we're trying to look at that completely end to end. Um, it really doesn't matter if the maker had the most amazing experience building a power app, if what they've produced is absolute rubbish. Uh, you know, if the end user doesn't love it at the end, um, we, we've still ultimately failed. Um, the, the app has, and as a platform we have as well. Um, so a lot of the work that we do, you know, I mean, focus when we're trying to design a feature is really thinking about, okay, how would, how is the maker going to configure this? How is the maker going to understand it? What's it going to look like to an end user? And ultimately, how do we prevent the maker from making bad decisions so that they can still easily build an app, but they're going to build an app that people want to use. Um, so, you know what I mean? That really means it's, it's not about us just banging out super quick features. And that's why we call it the app experience team is that we, we really do try and pivot our thinking, our research and our design around, okay, let's think about this experience end to end you know what I mean? Truly, how is it going to impact all of the different personas that use our product, the maker and the user and the admin, basically everyone that gets involved? Yeah. Uh, w one of the things that, you know, I've seen a focus in the last couple of years is the the area of kind of uh, usability across the platform. And, you know, back in pre, let's say, two years ago, even three years ago, I know in dealing in government type contracts, um, within the Australian federal government would often come up against whether it was compliant as a web app, you know, from mm -hmm. a, um, um, a usability perspective and what standards. So, there's, so Clay, what specifically does your team look at when it comes to guiding principles? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we overarching, our, our mission really is how do we enable people to build awesome apps? Um, really simple, but it's a big, big task. Um, and ultimately, this is through research, through user feedback. One of the one of the big, big things that we found back is that um, you know, people need it to be simple. Um, people need it to be easy to understand. It's not it, you know gone are the days that people are learning this technology for a decade before they're developing in it, um, and it's changing at a rate where we're introducing new features regularly. And every time we introduce something, we can't expect people to go off and do a two-day course or do something along those lines. Um, so really every feature that we're looking at, um, existing and new, um, we're really trying to approach it from how do we make simple things simple? Um, how do we remove that learning overhead so that someone that is either used to power apps or are new to power apps can actually come in, leverage that feature, and sort of going back to what I was talking about earlier, leverage it in a way that's going to be beneficial to their end users not in a way that's actually going to hurt the app that they're building or the customization that they're doing. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So so one of the things, you know, Dynamics has been around a long time, um, you know, since 2003, um, as in, and I'm talking really on what was formerly known as CRM and what has morphed into Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform from a CE perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is it's a mature app, but within it, there there are, if you like, what I call V1 features. Mm. Um, two that, if you like, jump to mind is the concept of themes. I don't know that there's been much work done in the last <laughs> couple of years on, on, on that little piece. Uh, you know, no, the, no, it's the, relatively static. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the other one that jumps to mind was um, 
And even as I'm saying it, I'm like, I know there's new features around hierarchies, but the first version of hierarchies that was done was single entity. In other words, you could build account-based hierarchies or mm. contact, but you couldn't do account contact type hierarchies, you know, and visualize that. And I know there's been work done in more recent times, really it's showing the hierarchy, for example, in the sales app of, of a relationship. So mm. that aside, is part of this transition to the power platform and um, you know the separation that has gone on in the last eighteen months to two years um, between the pl you know the app the platform if you like and then the app layer? Do you see that you're having to kind of tidy up some of these old legacy V one never had work done on them and then decide how you take those forward into the future? Yeah, absolutely, um, and I mean. It, it really falls into uh, two categories. Uh, so some are things like, uh, you know, the form designer, the view designer. Uh, they're commonly used, you know what I mean? Lots of people in them every single day. They have a great feature set, but it was very old UI. So for new people coming in, uh, you know what I mean? Not, not very intuitive how, how they can get started. Uh, so there's, and like, we've already got a new form designer in preview. We've got a new view designer in preview, um, letting you do really basic things like drag and drop and preview your data and things that were just never in the originals. Um, and, and those types of changes we prioritize mainly based on, uh, user volume. If it's an area that's frequented, um, if it has a lot of usage, we're investing in, in getting those experiences up to date. Um, that's going to be a long journey for us um, because as you met, like there's lots of stuff in the platform um, and we don't want to go dark for, you know, two years while we just go rebuild things that only two people around the world are ever using. Um, so a lot of that, there's that, there are other things and themes is actually a great example um, where this is something that now we actually want it to do a lot more than ever it was originally intended. Um, so one of the things that we'll be looking at, and this is realistically a next year thing, like a 2020 thing, um, but we've started our design around it now, uh, is how do we actually just do a common theming engine, um, that runs across canvas, across model, across PCF, across absolutely everything. Um, so that ultimately you can come into a modern designer, build a theme and it gets used everywhere in your app. Um, so that's sort of the, the second half of those types of legacy experiences where we, we don't want to just put a new liquor paint on it, you know, paint it purple and give it a modern experience. Like we actually want to think about the framework level of it and how do we make sure that it's going to be a first class theming experience for the next, you know, five years, 10 years as, as well. So um, it really depends on the feature, um, but it's, it's definitely something that we're seeing. We're not just rebuilding things for the fun of it. Like we're not just rebuilding things so they can be purple. Um, Really for us, it's about how do we make things simpler, you know what I mean? And how do we sort of bring some of these experiences into a modern UI that people can understand, get to use. Um, another big push we've been driving as well, it's not really something we blog about, but as a lot of these new experiences, we've invested heavily in accessibility. Um, so people using screen readers and uh, keyboard operations, uh, you know what I mean? Far, far easier in the new experiences than a lot of mm -hmm. the legacy. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So what are the areas you're investing in at the moment? What are your kind of key focuses right now moving in towards the end of 2019? Yeah, so there's there's two main ones, especially sort of for where I'm focused. Um, the first, and this will hopefully be a common answer you'll get from anyone from our team uh, on your podcast, is quality and fundamentals. <laughs> um, ultimately, the, you know what I mean, the biggest uh, impact to sort of customer pain that we ever see is if, you know what I mean? We release uh, a build with bugs in it or we have performance issues or anything like that. So maintaining that health, um, you know what I mean? Takes time uh, and, and takes investment. So uh, we're continuing to push on that. Um, and that will that'll be something that we sort of always continue to invest in. Um, so that's the first one. And that's really around making sure that experiences where you're building an app 
are nice and performant and reliable. And then also the end user, you know what I mean? The, uh, so that the apps that you build go out, run fast um, and, and don't have errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another cool sense. switch on that, um, which we're, we're sort of kicking up an effort this year is you would have things, seen things out already like the Power Apps Checkers. Um, so helping you identify issue, potential issues in solutions and in apps. Uh, we're going one further with that. Um, it's work that's kicking off this semester and likely will hopefully be in preview towards the end of the year um, around actually allowing you to debug Canvas apps as well. So with a live running app, being able to see like session traffic and what's coming in and out and what's happening with your connectors, um, something that we just don't have the ability to do within apps today. Um, so again, that's sort of the not only our own quality of apps and fundamentals, but starting to see how we can provide some of these tools out to our app makers and users so that they can make sure their app you know, I mean, is of the right quality and, and has the right fundamentals focus as well. The second big one for us is sort of that theme I was talking about earlier about you know, how do we allow people to do more complex things, but just in a simpler way. Uh, and so the, you know, the enabling more complex things really comes into, we're working a lot with how we make CDS work, uh, just far easier, uh, while you're building an app, how to interact with data. So you've already seen some things come out, like, uh, working with polymorphics, um, navigating relationships in the expression language. So a lot there is just about making that simpler. PCF this year, um, you know what I mean? We're going to release that across model and across Canvas. Um, so really that's a way for, I mean, really it will be the first foray of pro devs being able to come into a Canvas app and being able to build a control, um, you know what I mean, completely custom uh, on their own. And so, so the challenge for us is as we bring in this new functionality, new frameworks and new tools, making sure that we keep things as simple as we possibly can. Um, so, I mean, we've done other stuff in the last month, like, um, now you can do drop down, uh, uh, like cascading drop downs without having to write expressions. It can be configured through properties. Um, we're doing investments in things like filtering, filtering and sorting, being able to do that through a designer experience rather than having to write expressions and having to write code. So, um, really that that's, it's a long list of, of smaller items, but ultimately it rolls up into one of those two buckets. You know what I mean? How do we improve quality, both ours and our makers? And how do we enable people to, you know, do more complex things in their apps and build richer apps, but just do it in a far simpler way than they can today? So, so, so do you see that almost in the future that the, you know, particularly with this um, PCF coming to market, do you see the day where you almost wouldn't recognize it as a traditional Microsoft piece of software necessarily, um, that people would be able to tailor it to that degree? Or do you think there will always be overriding themage, you know, that is kind of Microsoft's DNA shining through? So, I mean, I, I think one thing, there, there's a yes and a no part, I think, to that yeah. answer. Um, so, I mean... We already see people today, uh, you know what I mean? Like a guy in our team, Brian Dang, uh, went and built like block games and, and things that look like nothing that Microsoft would uh, ever produce. So like Canvas gives you a lot of flexibility there. Um, and we do want to open some things up to be easier. You know, we were talking about theming, branding. People want apps to look, um, you know what I mean? How the rest of their suite looks and how the rest of their organization looks. So we definitely want to make some of those things easier. Um, at the same time, though, one of the things we are doing is we want to align more closely with um, how the rest of Microsoft applications look. So, you know, I mean, the fabric controls, um, which are, you know, I mean, a lot of very commonly used in Office and in Azure um, for things like buttons and drop downs and, and field boxes and grids. Um, we want those to be available to you in, in Power Apps as well, so that as an end user, if I'm moving across Microsoft applications, the second I step into a Power App, it doesn't feel odd or out of place. It just feels natively like the rest of the Microsoft suite. So that'll be sort of like our default set of controls and components that people have available to us. But you're absolutely right. Um, with PCF, it means you can really go build it to look however you want it to look. Um, and, and ultimately, um, you know what I mean? This, this way of people getting to more white labeled applications, removing our branding from it, 
having their own color schemes is becoming more and more common. Yeah, yeah. I just see I see a future, you know, model where people will be able to build an application, let's say on the P2 SKU, sell it to a customer without any kind of reference to that licensing construct because it'd be bundled in a in a fee, you know, as a SaaS monthly usage of the the of the product as such, and be tailored totally to uh, you know, unique industry vertical that has some specialized need, but there wouldn't be a need to have all the legacy of, you know, you need to have 50 Microsoft P2 licenses or whatever, because the licensing construct would include all that, but it would be kind of like, you know, duck the, the you know, uh, still on the surface, paddling fast below the surface type scenario that, it would be the truly the ability to create any type of app business application in that like white label experience almost. Do you see that coming? Well, I mean, licensing aside, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely, like that's the vision for the app. You know what I mean? We we want you to have the tools available to you to build the app to look exactly the way you want it to do, um, want it to be. Sorry, and I and I think that's what I was sort of um, going before. I think by default. You know what I mean? We do have a lot of customers and there's a lot of desire for it to look and feel like the rest of Microsoft. Um, but we're definitely not going to prevent people from sort of breaking out of that shell, doing their own themes, doing their own controls. And really, to your point, you know what I mean? Doing any type of UI or custom visualization that they want. Yeah. So, so uh, if you were to look into the crystal ball and, you know, with what PCF's bringing, you know, I've seen things like um, a mate of mine, Steve Mordu, he's created a control. He was on the early access program, a control that does, you know, Gantt charts, you know, from a, a project uh, perspective, all as a PCF control, which, you know, looks looks quite cool. What are the type use cases of kind of unique controls that you know, there's been no need, if you like, to ship to the platform? My mind goes to something like Telerik controls as an example, where you can do, you know, all, all sorts of various calendar functionalities, um, um, or all different types of interactive component type objects. Do you see, yeah, what, what are, from a creative perspective, what do you see the possibilities in the future? Well, we, honestly, I, I, I think the, the reason we're building this framework is because I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, and really, every single day, um, we hear a different example where people are coming to us going, oh, do you have a control that can do this? Do you have a component that can do this? Um, and and ultimately, the reason we want to enable people with, with PCF and with Canvas components as well is so that we can get out of people's way and that they can go build them. But I mean, like we've seen anything from um, like interactive people do, doing certain types of buttons and controls um, to various visualizations. Um, so how they want to present data and rating scales and really simple controls. But when you don't have it and you've got a specific desire of the visualization for your app and how you want it to look, it's, it's hard to go ahead and build. Um, we've already seen people doing that in PCF. As you mentioned, people going then like very advanced and building th um, things like a Gantt chart um, other cool ones as well that we've seen are um, like image annotation. So the ability to take a picture, be able to draw on it, you know, I mean, in a great service scenario, whether on a mobile or a desktop device, and then actually save that back to your record. Not a complex scenario, um, but PCF allows you to go build that as a packaged component, use it across your app, which is awesome. Yeah, I was, I, I, was, uh, I had a colleague involved with a bit of software years ago around ads for, you know, television stations. Mm. And uh, they created a, a component that would allow you to play the video to a point um, and then give feedback to the creative. You know, I don't want this prop here, I want the prop over here. And you could draw and move it ah, in, a, in a video, cool. you know, interface type experience. So what you're saying is that type of thing, which was in a highly specialized piece of software, could be built now within you know the frameworks that you're providing and if you like reach a, a large audience that doesn't necessarily have the big budgets um, yeah absolutely you know. and i mean and a large point of it is reuse as well um you know what i mean there, there's there's a lot of stuff that today you could you can go do on canvas with leveraging base controls and images and expressions um but that 
for a, especially a developer with a potentially different skill set that came from JavaScript, that came from a React background, using something like PCF is going to feel a lot more natural and a lot easier for them to go build. So, so one of the comments I've heard is, why isn't React supported um, in P- <laughs> PCF? It's- it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Hopefully, again, even by the time this gets posted, uh, mm-hmm. we may have support for it. Um, yep. But it is definitely something that uh, we are focused on. It's on our list for the GA of PCF. Nice, nice. Another comment, um, uh, feedback after I think I had Charles Lamana on the show was around um, why weren't just something like Telerik controls supported um, in PCF? Now, in my mind, I'm like, well, Microsoft don't own them, so you're not going to take a dependency on something you don't necessarily own. And I assume there'd be additional lifting just to support a a one-off company, you know, even though they've got a, a, a massive control framework out there or con- a number of controls. Yeah. Any other ad- ad answer you would give to that question, why you didn't just go and support some third-party control framework? No, I, I mean, yeah, it's it's very much along the lines of, you know what I mean, support and how we manage it. Um, you know what I mean? The, the time we're investing with React now, we want to make sure that, that it versions correctly, that it bundles correctly, it operates performantly. Um, it's There's a lot of things even with PCF today to do, sorry, a lot of things even with PCF today um, that you can pull in lots of different libraries and use them and build in your app. Um, for us, React especially is more about us supporting it in a first class way. Yeah, nice. So so what can you tell me about the new model-driven maker experience? And I, you know, I don't even know that I should use the word model-driven. Uh, I don't know how far down the path you are of kind of making just a maker experience that covers Canvas as well as model. Mm. Um, you've mentioned to me uh, offline maker.powerapps.com. Um, but, make.powerapps.com. Uh, oh, sorry, make. You yep. are correct. I've even written down as make, but make.powerapps.com, <laughs> which is a... a still accessible right now from web.powerapps.com the preview is that right correct and and, and really this is um the, we've we've started up a, a sort of a new um not a new version but um you know what i mean a, a new set of uh, infrastructure that we're building a lot of our our new designers in and our portal um so visually it's very very similar um but it's a it's more performant um you know what i mean there's a lot of sort of like infrastructure and fundamental reasons that we we've moved to that um but ultimately from a functionality perspective it's it's very much the same um some of the cool things that are in that new experience though by default um, are a lot of things like the new entity experience, the new form designer, the new view designer. Um, and they've been built on this new make.powerapps.com infrastructure that I was talking about. Um, it does some really cool things that are really simple, um, but A, it is more performant for us to move around. Um, we get some more engineering efficiencies in, in sharing content and libraries between it. Um, but it also does cool things like it doesn't do a lot of pop-outs. It allows you to navigate quickly between objects. Um, and what you'll see is that it's it's a bit of a vision for us in how we see all these different designers working together. Um, but you'll see more and more uh, of our new experiences light up in make.powerapps.com. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So really what we would have gone to in settings in the past and drilled down to, you know, uh, maybe create a new view or customize a form, etc. We would expect now to get all that type of experience from make.powerapps.com. Correct. And, and right now, we, you know, I mean, we we still have the the legacy experiences through settings, and um, and we have the new make.powerapps. Um, as we basically build up that. Um, you know, that critical mass of feature parity in the new experiences, we will make a shift at one point where um, even if you go to custom settings, customize in Dynamics 365, by default, you'll come into those newer Power Apps experiences rather than the legacy. Yeah, fantastic. But we want to do that at the right time. We don't want to rush it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's only in preview at the moment, right? Correct. Both the view and form uh, yep. uh, designers are both in preview, but they will be coming out to GA as well. Yeah, so I haven't had a play with them as yet, but you know, one of the things I really liked in the old experience is that if you needed to create a new field that wasn't already, if you like, in CDS, you could just hit the new button, specify what field type it was, etc., whether you want it audited, you know, uh, mm. all, all those type of features. 
Is that going to be in the maker experience that you could quickly on the fly create a new field? Absolutely. And, and, and a bid? Excellent. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so it will be there. Um, I don't know if it's in the late, the version that's out right now. Mm -hmm. It might not be in the new form designer and view designer yet. Um, yeah. But uh, there's... We definitely, we're, we're all about um, these being parity plus. <laughs> um, nice. We don't want them to do less than the old yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, but I mean like some cool things even on the form designer now, like you actually get a rendered UCI preview of your form. Brilliant. You can drag and drop on it and rearrange mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, rearrange fields. So it's got some really cool things um, that, that we didn't support in the old one. Um, but I think the preview might not have new field yet. But mm -hmm. it is definitely something that's in in the plans. Excellent. So reusable canvas components. Where where are we up to in that? And can you get, kind of give some background into your thinking around it? Yeah, absolutely. So this one's really cool. It's an ex, it's an experimental feature um, for us at the moment. Um, but uh, all going well. Our plans this year is that it will move to full preview and it will move to GA. Um, all in the space of this year. Um, basically, the the this gives us two uh, two main things. Well, Canvas had a lot of power. You know, the expression language and the base controls. We we saw people build absolutely amazing things. Um, one of the things that was very unpleasant about it was that it was also very time consuming. So, if you wanted to build like really simple examples, like a menu or a header that sat on the top of every screen of your app, you would build that and then copy and paste it across multiple screens. Um, if you then had to make a change to that, you would make it in multiple places. Super unpleasant. Um, but this is really where components comes in in its simplest example and helps, is you can build something reusable to be able to be used across that app. Um, and we've already seen people doing cool things with it, you know, um, from basic examples like a header all the way through to doing um, someone built like a mapping control with point to point distance and routing. Um, but they build that as a canvas control, basically the, the, com the sorry, canvas component. It sort of obscures away a lot of the complexity that the original maker had to go through to call services and different data connections. And it ultimately means that the maker building the app is dragging something on that has some input and output properties and they're able to build a much richer app. Um, so, a, it's going to make hopefully the worlds of makers just a lot simpler when they're building, make them a lot more efficient in how they're building an app and maintaining an app. Um, but it's also then even for us, uh, we have resources working on building out of the box components as well. So things like a header and these things that we see people building really regularly, um, they'll be available in a gallery so that you can gotcha. just sort of drag them on and use them because we know everyone ends up building a menu. We know yeah, everyone yeah. builds up, um, you know, a tab control or something along those lines. Exactly. So we want to start exposing a lot of those out of the box. Um, the next step, which is, is sort of why this is an experimental and not GA yet, is one of the things that we'll be then releasing um, this year is they'll be fully solution aware. So... Right, so you could use them across apps. Correct. You'll be able to use it. Yeah. Right now, you can do it through an import-export process, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we want that to become way, way easier so that yeah. you can then basically just say, okay, I build a component. I want to sort of publish this to my environment and make uh, allow other people to use it. And then other people in your environment can just go ahead and go, yep, I'm building an app. Oh, I want my company's header on the top of this screen and pull it in really, really quickly. So um, it's a it's a huge one for us. Uh, it's in very early stages, but we're, we're already seeing really good things be done with it. Um, so we're gonna be focusing a lot this year and just making sure it lands well. We finish off these pending features that we have around it, um, you know, and we get it out for people to use in their production apps. Yeah, I, I think it's so important. You know, I see some of the, in London here, some of the bigger companies that are, that are, you know, they've already built, you know, 50, 100 different apps. Um, and there's this whole need to, if you like, maintain uh, experience consistency, if you like, because they're internal to the organization that publicly facing, but you still need to create that kind of consistency. So you're not retraining staff all over again on a new way that, you know, the devs try to do their interface or navigation or the headers, as you're saying. Um, so I think that's going to, you know, create a lot less um, headaches for those larger organizations. Yes, absolutely. 
So um, how are you bringing Canvas and model-driven apps together? I know that's one of your goals, your journeys to kind of bring that um, maker experience together. Where, where are you up to and, and, and how are things going? Uh, going well. Uh, so uh, really our, our goal, our longer-term goal for us is we don't want, you know, people's first decision in the platform to be Canvas or model. Uh, we want to remove that and we just want people to build apps. Um, ultimately though, uh, the reason we have both and the reason we're not going to get rid of either one of them, uh, is that, uh, independently they have a great set of features. You know what I mean? Canvas is very, very powerful in giving you this fine grained control, connecting to 240 plus data sources. Um, you know what I mean? Huge flexibility in the UX, great for designing mobile experiences, lots of power. Big, big, complex applications, multiple forms over um, data sets and, uh, and connecting to CDS data, model driven, far more powerful. Um, so really the challenge for us and you know, our goal over the next 12 to 18 months is how do we bring these together in a way that we're closing the gaps and the pains and not actually compromising these features. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're, this is a, you know, this happened at the MVP summit and, you know, I mean, it comes up whenever I, I, we talk about converging our app types, people are like, well, which one, which one are you going to keep? <laughs> um, and now, like I said, our, our goal isn't to, to get rid of either one of them. Uh, it's really to just remove the choice. So one of the things that we are investing this year is, um, it's internally dubbed at the moment, uh, canvas pages, but really it's just about us building a, a responsive uh, way to build Canvas apps, um, which in its own right is hugely valuable. Um, and and something that we've, I, uh, you may have seen, we released an experimental feature for you to do like responsiveness through expressions. Um, we released that in January. Um, so we've sort of done the first, you know what I mean, teaser in this area. Um, really the investment for us moving forward is how do we make this like a fully configurable experience um, and make it far easier. Once we have those responsive pages and responsive components, that's going to be really a key part for us in then being able to bring that responsive canvas page into the model driven world and start seeing these blend. Um, so it's by no means going to be quick. Um, you know, what I mean, even things we talked about earlier, theming, how does that work across the two? Um, but, but ultimately the, the, I mean, the positive side of it for me as we look as it, while it is a long journey, Canvas components, PCF responsiveness are massive uh, sort of steps on that journey. Um, and they're, they're all hugely valuable in their own right. Um, so ultimately, sort of as we you, people will see it come together, um, you know, closer and closer over the over the next twelve to eighteen months. Um, but ultimately, our goal is that anything we're bringing in, we're not just doing for the fun of it. Um, we'll release things independently, like PCF and and responsive pages, so that people are getting value. Um, and hopefully, it's a relatively gradual experience for people that they can just sort of see. Oh, okay. Now in a model-driven app, I can use a Canvas page. Oh, now in a Canvas app, I can use a form. I can use a view. And they'll just over time get closer and closer and until those lines are so blurred that it's just a power app. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So uh, another thing that's you know come up in recent times is there's it used to be that if you want to edit an app, and I'm just going to talk about dynamics here so it doesn't confuse people that are kind of live in the Canvas world as much, and you'd just jump into settings and you would make your edits. So if you like, you had one, you know, place to go now, um, before you came on the show, I'd, I'd listed seven different URLs to remember. Um, and, and you've given me another one. So we're up to eight, <laughs> you know, from, uh, and, and for the listeners, I'm going to place them in the uh, show notes so you, you can see the various, <laughs> um, portals, if you like, that allow you to admin or do various um, carry out various uh, steps or functionality configuration, et cetera, in the back end. Is there an intention to kind of go, hey, this is the one URL you need to know, and we're going to put a, a top level nav that allow you to, this is the admin section, this is the maker section, this is the deploy your instance section, this is a Power BI flow, that type of thing? What, what's, you know, I can understand how we've got to seven, you know, as part of this mm. journey, but is there an intention to then kind of wrap into a, here's the one, place you need to go as somebody that works with the technology um, and we'll make sure everything jumps off out of there. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll definitely start seeing these come together. Um, I'll first say that like our priority is more on how do we make the experiences really cohesive and easy to navigate between. Um, you mean less about the number of URLs. Um, if, if people are used to going to a particular URL, like, you know, admin.powerapps.com versus admin.powerplatform, you know what I mean, .com, that's totally fine. Like, I, I, I'm less concerned about the, um, the URL. Uh, but what we are doing is we're making sure that, you know what I mean, I can go to, uh, you know what I mean? Like right now we're directing web.powerapps to, to make.powerapps. Um, but you can go there, you can see all your apps, whether they're Canvas or model. You can open up the admin center from there. Um, admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com. If you haven't seen it, definitely worth a look. Um, it's the new admin center to rule them all. Um, and basically what you can do from there is there's a lot of cool functionality, not just in sort of managing environments and apps, but also analytics. Um, and it, it'll, it'll take you back to the, the older legacy dynamics experience if it needs to, like if it doesn't have a particular feature, it will drop you back. Um, but what you'll notice is similar to the way I was talking about, uh, make.powerapps.com and the old customization experience. As we get feature parity and we get that critical mass, you'll see more and more of these come together. Um, ultimately, though, at the top level, you'll still see, you know, Power Apps Flow and, and Power BI. We want those to be super easy for you to navigate between. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of customers as well and a lot of users that use exactly. one of those products. Yep. yep. So totally we're not going to go sense. like rip everyone's URL out tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. So is there anything you can share with what's coming up in the next release notes? Oh, not apart from all the other things I've already let slip on this podcast. I don't really know <laughs> if there's, um, look, really it's, it's going to be, I, I suspect we're, we're actually finalizing our release notes at the moment. Um, it will be a relatively short list. Um, it's, it's not going to be, you know, I mean, a, a thousand features. Um, as I said before, we're a, apart from our qualities and fundamentals focus, um, we're really focused on, you know what I mean? Attacking simplicity um and, and making it across the product and that's from a end user stuff so some improvements in uci navigation and uci grids and then on the maker side making sure we get pcf to ga get canvas components to ga and get responsive pages out um so it's a short list but you know what i mean we feel it's going to be a really impactful list yeah exciting exciting um what about, uh, I'm sure you've heard the numbers, I'm not sure if you're in the session that I was in, around Microsoft's goal of 10 million, um, uh, 10 million active million users on, on yes. the platform. Is that right? Is that what the goal yep. is? Yep, we want to enable the next 10 million developers. Yeah, now I love that. I love that. Well, so is that like a um, just a rally cry or is that something that really has teeth behind it and uh, that's a really kind of you are pulling to, to that, that outcome we are i mean like the the only thing i will say about it being a little bit of a rally cry is it, you know it is definitely one of the numbers that we look at um our mps around net promoter score um which is how satisfied people are with the product is also a very uh, important number for us so we would definitely not sacrifice one for the other uh or sorry we would not sacrifice mps i suppose uh is probably the better way to say it um but no look it it really is if you uh well we obviously don't disclose these numbers externally um the the power apps user growth is absolutely phenomenal um you know what i mean over the the few years that it's been in market uh it continues to grow along with canvas model driven um and really we we feel Bearing really strongly about the, the things we're bringing in this year are going to start just in removing more of those cliffs and just enabling more people. Uh, so, yeah, you know, what I mean, for us, it's a very real goal. Like, let's go get the next 10 million developers and get them on the power platform and make awesome. them happy. <laughs> and when you're saying developers, right, we're talking about we're, we're talking about citizen developers, not just, you know, cool. if you like pro dev type uh, devs, aren't we? Correct. And, and I mean, like, that's really something that um, we you know, we usually for these but like things like we want to enable the next 10 million we we can't give the long list of definitions of people that we that use our platform but we do you we we see people that are coming from someone's customizing a sharepoint form and adding a field you know what i mean the next person's building a simple um you know what i mean data entry app for a mobile device 
all the way through to people that are building custom controls and completely bespoke uh, line of business applications. Um, so yeah, when we talk about a, a, a power platform developer, it is a it is a huge spectrum of people. Yeah, yeah. Just one, uh, before I get on some quick fire questions to wrap up, um, offline access, I see, uh, I hear word on the street in the la- latest um, distro that's going out, that's starting to light up again. Um, it is is uh what what can you share on that uh so there there's just been a new preview uh that have launched has launched on offline uh and it's con- we're continuing to make improvements there uh, especially with our focus on mobile um offline is hugely important uh for that um and that's across canvas and model uh so we've recently re-released some uh sort of updated and improved experiences for model driven offline um but it'll be an area that we continue to invest in so um but you should definitely go check out the preview it's well worth it yeah awesome awesome okay some so some wrap-up questions that i have for you um what's hot on your reading watching or podcast list at the moment or are you just Ooh, okay. into uh game of thrones the whole time yeah, I was uh, so I did actually. I last night uh, again, whenever this airs, but last night was the Battle of uh, Winterfell, um, yeah. which was amazing. It, and I, is it, I is can't it going to be the battle now for the next three episodes? Though? It's well, <laughs> uh, you haven't watched it yet, obviously. So no, I won't. No, I've, I, do you know I've actually stopped part way through watching it tonight so I could do this podcast. Oh, <laughs> so I, I, I haven't seen the last Mark. fifteen minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then I won't ruin it for you. Um, no, no. But it's really good. Um, so we can talk about that next time we chat, but, um, the, so yes, definitely Game of Thrones. Uh, I just finished reading actually one of my favorite books that I've read a couple of times called An Organized Mind. Uh, it's all about the way people think and categorize things and process information. Um, and I, I have to reread it regularly because I forget all the improvements that it suggests. Um, Damien, uh, I'm going to, uh, I will send it to you. That's all right. Um, That'll be great. An organized yes. mind. And, it's, yep. and usually it's in my office, but I've lent a copy, that the one that's sitting in my office to someone. No, fair um, enough. Fair so enough. it's not sitting on my bookcase. Do you have any kind of hidden hidden talents outside of work that you really share with anybody? Uh, and, you know, I wanted to have a good answer to this one because I listened to <laughs> Charles's uh, podcast where he was just like, no, it's work and nothing else. So yeah, I was like, yeah. I need an answer to not make me sound like a total nerd. Um, I think probably the only thing that's, yeah, I did just call Charles a total nerd. Yeah, yeah, um, he's, he's just collecting his patent hoards, right? Doesn't yeah, exactly. He's got a patent button every time. Yeah. Um, the only thing that's probably sort of uh, not even moderately hidden that I do enjoy that I don't get enough time for is actually baking. Nice. Um, I really enjoy baking a nice pie. Uh, and the good thing about living in the US now is that everyone loves pie here. So... You know what I mean? Is Every it, time. Is it like a good meat pie, though? You know, like no, Australia no, no, no. They're really or... actually though. Next time you're in Seattle, there's an yeah. Australian pie shop. Okay. In uh, downtown Seattle now, that is nice. actually really good. But no, I'm okay. talking about like sweet pies, like tarts right. and yep. Yep. pumpkin pie and blueberry pie and key lime pie and and things like that. Wow. Okay. Awesome. 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 Um, what profession other than your own would you attempt if you could have like a parallel life? Ooh, um, it would probably be in theater. Um, okay. not, not necessarily on the stage. I have a big passion for musical theater, um, yep. in, in this world. And it was something even in high school I dabbled with. Uh, I just never really had the talent for it, but, mm-hmm. um, a, a large portion of my friends actually in Australia work in, uh, musical theater. And okay. if, it, if it's something I had the talent for and I didn't fall into tech, I think that's where I would be. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, and, and here's one final one out of left field. Um, what do you, what t- technology do you think is going to make the biggest impact in the next five years? Like in, yeah, if you oh. distill that into a word or a sentence. Just Ooh. one. Um. I I still think it's going to be the continuation of mobile. I I don't think it's right? hit its I don't think it's hit its pace yet. Um, I I I, I flash back to what I used to be able to do on a mobile device five years ago to what yeah. I can do now and and how much of my world is on it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know whether that's going to like distill itself into AR or you know what I mean mixed reality or anything like that um but you know I mean I I think so much now of how much I rely on my watch 
um, yeah. on my mobile fi- phone. It tells me like what my dog is doing. It unlocks my front door for me. It starts yeah. my car. Um, and that's been in the space of a couple of years. Um, I'm That's the space that I, I just continue to think will be busier, will be more mobile. Yeah. So and, why, why and we're going to we need just, devices to be able to do that. But why don't we just bypass those interfaces and just go for a neural lace connection to the brain? Like Johnny plug Mnemonic? Ourselves, pl- plug ourselves movie? into the network. <laughs> and yeah, but I don't think I'd, I, I have a, I'm, I have a shaved head, remember? So yeah. I don't have hair to like hide the little socket or however they'd connect. Oh no, I think it'll be at the base of your neck, right? Behind your type of plug. <laughs> I don't have hair there either, Mark. It's no, still, neither do it's I. Shaped, yeah. <laughs> I'm, as, I'm as bald as bald as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, uh, I, um, um, I think that is our future. We're going to become cyborgs. I'm down for it. <laughs> I'll give it a go for yeah. sure. <laughs> hey, so who do you recommend as a guest for the show in future? Ooh, um, I, there's three good people that I don't think you've had on, uh, depending okay. on the topics you want to chat about. Cool. Um, James Olnick for mm-hmm. all things admin. <laughs> so uh, I, I hit him up uh, when I was up at Summit. He was like, no, 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 I, I couldn't come on the show. And then like uh, three days after Summit, he comes back to me, actually, you know, I could come on the show. Yeah. So I'll get so him on. Get him on. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Julie Strauss. Yep. Uh, leads uh, our Julie. ISV and pro developer things like all the new tooling and yep. uh, lots of cool stuff coming out of her team. Awesome. Um, definitely great to her to connect with. Um, the other one is he's he's already pretty visible in the community, Brian Dang. Yep. Um, absolutely genius on Canvas apps, huge passion for education, yep. um, really great, very well connected to our community and customers and just awesome, he always is. inspiring to have a chat to. Excellent. Yes. Um, I follow him on Twitter. So, um, I get my daily update from Brian. So yeah, that's, that's a, that's a great list, um, of people. I'm glad you came with a, with a couple to choose from. Claire, it's been great to have you on the show before you go. If people want to, um, kind of follow what you're up to online, uh, you know, basically they can see into your world slightly. Are you on, are you on any social media channels? I am. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Clay B. Wesner, C-L-A-Y-B-W-E-S-E-N-E-R. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, Clay Wesner is my username there. Those are the easiest places to get me. Hey, thanks for listening. would love to hear from you. Please feel free to ask, connect, and share with me on any social platform by looking up NZ365Guy. If you enjoyed this show, can you please take a minute to leave a review on your podcast app or any uh, on the show notes page. Full show notes can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 99. Hey, see you next time.